Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we're continuing on with verse 252, which reads as follows. Sudha sang vajjamanye sang atanang panaduddha sang paresanhi so vajjani opunati yathabhu sang Atano pana cha deti kalingwa kitava satho. Which means easy to see are the faults of others, hard to see are one's own faults. The faults of others one winnows away like chaff. But one's own faults, one covers up like a fraud who covers up their deceit. So this verse was taught in response to a story, a very short story, related by a rich man named Mendika. And most of the backstory to the verse is relating to how Mendika became a rich man. But since it doesn't really relate to the verse, I'm going to skip it. It's also quite a fantastical story, I think probably uh, exaggerated to some extent. But the gist of it is that he was very generous, very kind, very thoughtful, uh, and and he was a great supporter of Buddhism in in the time of the Buddha Vipassi, I think, in the time of another Buddha. He uh, at one one time there was a famine in one of his past lives, and they were they stored as much rice as they could, but finally they were down to one pot of rice for him, his wife, his son, his daughter and his servant and so they split it up five ways but then they saw a an enlightened being some some religious person who exhibited all the qualities of a an enlightened being and they were so impressed by his countenance that they all decided to give their their meal their last meal to this religious person given as a, an, an offering, really in, in a way as an offering to dedicate to their own well-being. They used it as a support for their own determination to never have to starve again. And the story goes that as a result they did never starve again. So the lesson behind that is of course the, the this sort of rudimentary Buddhist lesson of being generous and I think we shouldn't ignore that. It doesn't have much to do with the verse at all. But uh, it is worth mentioning that many of these stories have some element relating to generosity. They remark upon the uh, well-being or the fortune of individuals as being a product of generosity and kindness and goodness in general. And that's an important Buddhist quality. I mean, it sounds somewhat it's somewhat awkward as a religious person myself to talk about such things, especially when they relate to generosity towards religious individuals, but I certainly, as I've said before, subscribe to this idea. Just because I'm a monk doesn't mean I don't believe that giving to enlightened beings, whether they be monastic or not, but even just giving to the monastic community is a great thing to do, something I do whenever I have the chance. Something we did last weekend uh, with the help of Jeff and, and with our, the help of our organization uh, for my birthday. We gave food to the monks there. and That's a, just a great thing to do. 
generosity, people who are generous, people who give and are kind, they know the power of it. They can appreciate this, the importance of this. But the real story behind this verse is quite simple. Mendika one day went to see the Buddha. And on his way to see the Buddha, he was confronted by a... Uh, someone, I can't remember, some some follower of a different religion And he asked, where are you going? He said, I'm going to see the Samana Gotama And he said, oh, why would you go to see him? You who are a Kiryavada Why would you go see someone who is a Kiryavada? You are a person who is Kiryavada Kiryavada means someone who well, literally believes in the uh, believes in action and it means the efficacy of action. It means that there is a result to your actions. Or that there is such a thing as an action that is that is potent. And Akiryavada is someone who doesn't believe in the potency of action. And Mandaka didn't actually respond as far as we, we read. He just continued on his way to see the Buddha, but he remarked to the Buddha about this, what this person had said to him. Maybe he wanted to get the Buddha's um, take on it or the Buddha's explanation of, of whether he was Giryavada or Akiryavada. But the Buddha turned around with this verse, focusing more on the, the nature of the uh, conversation as being confrontational, as being somewhat accusative and, and being focused on the faults of others It may very well have been that Mandaka had a problem with uh, obsessing over the faults of these individuals because, of course, when you point out someone else's fault that, that's quite an, an ugly sort of thing to do and so it's a fault yourself Perhaps he was waiting for the Buddha to say something bad about those people and the Buddha as a result, may have taught this to remind him not to focus on the faults of others. But it's certainly an indictment of these people who were very much focused on criticizing the Buddha for being someone who didn't believe in karma, which is a very egregious uh, indictment or, or claim, accusation. So that's the, the, the first lesson that we can derive from this story is uh, really about this this incidental usage of this dual categorization of being akiryavada and kiryavada so we can ask as a sort of a preparation to talk about the actual verse we can ask what is uh, uh, what is the buddha was the buddha akiryavada or was the buddha kiryavada so akiryavada uh, it can be understood in two ways And This sort of answers the question as to why these people would think In the first place that the Buddha was Akiryavada the, Didn't they think the Buddha, didn't they, hadn't they ever heard that the Buddha taught about karma? Well, first of all, the Buddha didn't teach about karma He taught about intention or inclination Right? Because in the time of the Buddha there was an There was an uh, a belief that actual physical actions, ritual actions of a very specific sort had potency. If you perform a ritual in the proper way, well, it wasn't even so much that that uh, results would occur. It was that it, w it was what God wanted you to do or it's what was right for you to do. It was your duty to do. If you were a religious person, your your duty is to do the rituals, because perhaps because over the course of thousands and thousands of years they'd forgotten why, but they just knew it was their duty, so they did what their parents and grandparents and ancestors had done. If you were a, of the of the royal class, it was your duty to fund the rituals, which is you know, a great teaching to perpetuate by the religious people, and so on. And so the Buddha did teach against this, and this may have been what they meant, but I assume more likely what they meant is that the Buddha taught against the, the concept of a soul, 
right? Because the Buddha taught non-self. And so this can be misunderstood as meaning that the Buddha, um, as a result, taught that we are just physical, right? Or that we are just automatons, that there is determinism. So Akiryavada might very well be an indictment of the concept of non-self, which is a very difficult concept to understand, so it's understandable that these people made that misunderstanding. So and it's quite likely that that's the case because the kiriyavada usually refers to a person who believes that there is a, a karaka, a, a self, a soul that acts. Like when we decide to do something, there is a, a soul that makes that decision. Right? But, yeah, of course, Buddhism denies not just that idea, but but the very framework within which it rests. So Buddhism, to understand non-self, Buddhism looks at reality in a different way. We, we look at reality from a point of view of experiences. It's not just about taking self out of the equation and then whatever's left, you've got just mindless actions. Rather, in, rather you have experiences and what we would think of as a self is actually just moments of experience. And, and actions, you know, in, mental inclinations that are potent And there is certainly a potency involved So that's the, the idea of Akiryavada and Kiryavada The Buddha, the Buddha himself um, did answer the question of whether he was Kiryavada But he answered it in a different way So in in the sense that it's usually meant the Buddha was Kiryavada in regards to the idea that there is a potency to our actions, but he was not Kiryavada in the sense of believing in a an entity. Simply because the Buddha didn't see the world or the Buddha taught not in the um the the, the framework of entities, but in the framework of experiences, which are momentary, and they arise and they cease. And if you start looking at the world that way, there's no room for the idea of a self. But when the Buddha answered, he said, yes, I, you, there's a way you could say I'm akiryavada, I don't believe in action. He said, because I teach people to not do any evil actions. So I teach the non-doing of evil actions, the akirya, the non-action in regards to evil. So a totally different interpretation. He denied being akiryavada in the in the ordinary sense. So that's enough of that. In regards to the actual lesson of the verse, we've heard this lesson or similar lessons to this. The Buddha was was often remarking on this dichotomy of how we relate to the faults of others and how we relate to the faults of, of our of our, our our own faults. And more generally, how we uh, relate to the external to others, and how we relate to ourselves, or even more generally, how we relate to the external world, and how we relate to the experiential inner world. I mean, it is an inner world because it's only happening to us. We only experience our own experiences. So I think we we can take this on two levels in in regards to the story. Uh, talking about how we approach the uh, issue or the the um, event when someone confronts us or accuses us, criticizes us, points out our faults. And this verse helps us understand this. It, it gives us a sort of a, a general basic Buddhist lesson in regards to dealing with criticism. It reminds us to... appreciate how uh, prone we are to seek out the faults of others. The, the imagery the Buddha uses is quite you know, pertinent as well. If you know anything about winnowing chaff, so chaff is the husks of rice. And w a person who winnows chaff is so obsessed, not with the rice, but with the chaff, that in a big pan of rice, they will find a way to to get the chaff out when we were picking blueberries we had these we we rigged up tweezers 
because we would pick blueberries and there was the, the stems and we would reach in with the tweezers and, and pull them out. When you're winnowing chaff, we saw them do it in India, but the, the, the idea is you have a big fan and you have a pan of rice and you shake up the rice and the rice goes up and falls back down in the pan. But when, when the chaff goes up, it's blown away by the fan. So a person who is, who is skilled at winnowing chaff they have to they have to get all the chaff out and they have to be very f obsessed with it so when you liken that to a person look, winnowing faults um it, it it's quite apt um because it becomes a habit where we overlook all the good qualities of others and hone in on their faults this is basically what the Buddha is saying. It becomes a habit. It's an interesting reminder of this bad habit of humanity that we fall into partiality based on greed, based on anger, based on delusion, based on fear. And we spend our time trying to find fault in others. We do it out of greed in order to manipulate others. Sometimes pointing out fault is a means of, of feeling better about yourself. Sometimes it's a means of ingratiating yourself with others. When when you demean others, they, you can manipulate them to the point that they rely on you. We do it out of anger because we want to hurt others with our criticism. We do it out of delusion, from many kinds of delusion. We do it out of wrong view, the belief that Something this person is doing right is wrong, so we criticize them for it. Many people criticize the Buddha for good things that he did, thinking that they were wrong. Uh, we criticize out of arrogance and conceit. It makes us feel better about ourselves. We we're able to pump ourselves up. We do it out of low self-esteem. We hate ourselves, so we... Uh, try to bring others down to our level, try to feel better about ourselves by bringing others down. And we do it out of fear, um, worry, you know, feeling like we're not adequate, we're inadequate, and it assuages our fear by reminding ourselves that others have... It. Our, our minds are perverse in their approach to others. Buddhism is very much about focusing on oneself. And... Well, I don't think it's proper to um, open your faults. Like you shouldn't be spreading your faults to others, like chaff. You know, sh showing them the the bits of you that that are faulty. I don't think it's proper or really good, right? Because if you're constantly telling other people what faults you have, you're encouraging them to 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 criticize you, right? Knowing that others are prone to criticism, you really shouldn't be too concerned or too interested in in presenting your faults to others. But we spend far too much energy trying to hide our faults. And it's really to no avail because everyone's putting a microscope on us anyway. One interesting thing about this verse is it seems to be contradicting itself because... The faults of others are 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 not e shouldn't be easy to see. If we're all hiding them, if everyone's hiding their faults, and the, and we are, it actually is quite difficult to see the faults of others. We don't know the extent of of other people's suffering or their evil or their unwholesomeness. Someone can look like a very uh, wholesome, pleasant, good person, kind person, but inside have great corruption and, and mental issues. They can they can be engaged in great evil in, in private and secret. But what the verse means, I think, and, and what it does point out is that we're better able to see the faults of others for two reasons. And this relates to how we should understand it as meditators, I think. We're better able to see the faults of others because we're objective about them. We're not so objective about our faults. We're not so objective about our faults because at the time when we are faulty, when we're uh, uh, overwhelmed by greed or anger or delusion, our minds are not in a clear state. 
none of these states can arise with clarity of mind. That's the very uh, definition or, or nature of evil, is that it's always associated with unwholesome, with, with darkness, with delusion. And so because of that, at the time when we are doing something wrong, we really are not in a position or, or a state of mind to be able to appreciate the wrongness of it. Whereas with others, because it's not us, because we're not engaged in unwholesome, it's quite, quite often quite easily. We can see all the little uh, imperfections of other people's characters. The, uh, it is an important lesson to not do that, to change the way we, we engage with others. And meditation helps us to see this. I think it's important to understand that an enlightened person doesn't spend much time trying to change others or criticizing others. And that the vast majority of the times that we are inclined to criticize, point out other people's faults, is based on unwholesomeness based on bad habit, based on even just a desire to change others, which may seem like a, a positive thing, but ends up being obsessive and, and controlling and usually harmful. Usually our efforts are met with anger and arrogance. I, you know, who are you to tell me? It's, all, it's very hard to rightfully criticize someone. It's very hard to having rightfully criticized someone, have it actually benefit them. And so one more lesson is, conversely, knowing this, when people do criticize us, and the Buddha taught this as well, we should try our best to appreciate that criticism. When others do criticize us, we understand that that's what people are prone to do. Where our whole lives were always going to be criticized. The Buddha said, no one is free from criticism. And knowing that, we should pr be prepared for it, expect it, and understand how to deal with criticism. You know, the many books and, and, and non-Buddhist teachers have taught about dealing with criticism. Your therapist will tell you how to deal with criticism. Your parents will tell you. We talk about having a thick skin, don't be thin-skinned, and so on. But it's important. It's very important. It's embarrassing as a Buddhist to get angry when someone criticizes you. As long as we have arrogance and, and self-worth, our attachment to self, ego, we're always going to get upset when others criticize us. So an important Buddhist practice is to overcome that and to understand the wrongness of, of uh, reacting negatively to criticism. Sometimes we want to uh, criticize someone back or so on. But on a deeper level in regards to our practice, this is a, a good example of how mindfulness benefits both our own mental health and our relationships with others. Because mindfulness helps you see things just as they are. It helps you relieve you of this need to change others or change the world around you. And so as a result, it makes people more comfortable around you. They feel like they can be themselves. People will will admit things to you that they wouldn't to others because they know you're not judging them. Think of that. Think of that when you think of how good it is to criticize and how good you are at pointing out the flaws of others. No one likes that. No one appreciates that. And most astutely, it's right for someone to say, if you're prone to criticism... That's a fault of yours. And so you are worthy of criticism when you're prone to criticize others. But when we're mindful, our experience of others is just our experience of them. When they say something, it's an experience of sound. When we think about what they've said, it's an experience of thinking. When we think of who they are, that's all just con concepts in our mind, and we see those concepts. So we focus much more on our experience of them. It doesn't mean we don't know that they're there or we don't understand their situation, but it does filter and purify that. Purify it because it relates it back to what is actually happening, not how we interpret it, whether we like it or dislike it, what we want to do to change it, and so on. 
And so our relationships with others, this is a very good example of how they, again, they are purified and, and harmonized. But internally, I think the most important lesson is how we approach our own faults. Because we don't just hide them from others, which as I said, doesn't have to be a negative thing. Now, actively hiding them may be, but it, it could even be positive to not show your faults to others because of, how, again, how it can cause problems. That's not the real problem. The real problem, or the big problem, is how we hide them from ourselves. We hide them from ourselves by uh, rationalizing them. We hide them from ourselves by um, understanding, misunderstanding them. So again, the idea that our faults are not actually faults. We um, hide them from ourselves or we ignore them by hating ourselves. You know, we, we render ourselves ineffective at dealing with them by saying, yeah, there I go again doing this or doing that. I'm just a terrible person, which is a useless thing to do. I mean, it's not only hateful, that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that it makes us ineffectual. It's like a, an answer, it's a defense mechanism of sorts. Because as long as you remind yourself that you're not able to deal, not you're, you're, you're just such a bad per you're that sort of bad person. If you're that sort of bad person, well then yeah, you have no power to change, because it's who you are. But it's not who you are, it's just habit, as everything is. So the way meditation changes this, and especially the mantra meditation, is on three levels. On the perception level, when you note, for example, let's, let's look at one of the hindrances. So if you're angry, if you're an angry sort of person, and you say to yourself, angry, angry, you, you, the word focuses you on the, on the experience. And you see the anger as something that arises and ceases. You see it, it ceases pretty quickly. Because it can't exist with mindfulness. But you see it for what it is, and so that changes your perception of it. Uh, your perception of your faults changes you from, from maybe getting caught up in the anger and thinking, yeah, I should do something about this anger, maybe hurt others or say things that are unpleasant to others. It changes it on the thought level. You see, the thing about a, a noting, a mantra, is it is a thought. It's a mental activity, it's a mental construct, it's conceptual, it's an act of conceptualizing. And it's meant to be a replacement for the ordinary conceptualizing that we do. When you're angry, you conceptualize it as, I am angry, and this person made me angry, and I don't deserve whatever they did to make me angry, and so on, right? Our, our, th our thought process this is the wrongness of our thought, thought process. We, we are oblivious to the nature of the anger because we're focused on maybe the other person or whatever it was that caused our anger or whatever we're going to do about our anger, with our anger. And so when we say to ourselves, angry, all of that is gone. There is no conceptualizing beyond anger. What is this? How do I conceive of anger? It's anger. Greed, when you want something, what you want, you know, how you're going to get it, gone. Because there's only the wanting. And finally, on the level of views, the, per, the perversion of views is, is done away with by as a result of the process of noting. Because as you note and your clarity in on the perception level where you perceive things as what they are, you, you think of them as they are, your view becomes the observation, the conclusions that you draw based on your observations, as though it were a science experiment. Because your observations are so clear, you're able to understand, ah yes, anger leads to this, this led to the anger, because I was unmindful, I allowed this experience to uh, pervert my perception, to, to corrupt my mind and to delude me into thinking that somehow it was wrong and that I had to fix it and so on. I mean, it's not even really a thought process, it's just your awareness of what's happening, seeing the way things go and what are the results and how horrible it is to be an angry person or a greedy person or a deluded person or so on. 
So this verse really reminds us of the importance of meditation. It reminds us of a very important problem that we have of hiding our faults and focusing too much on the external world, which includes and, and often is very much centered around our relationship to others and how we are obsessed about how they're better than us, how they're worse than us, what's wrong with them, what's right with them, and so on. And not just people, the world in general, the world around us, as opposed to our experience of the world around us. Again, our focus on changing and fixing other people is mostly wrong-headed. It can be a very good thing to point out the faults of others if you do it right, but again, very difficult thing to do. It's important for friends to do, it's important for parents to do, but it's also very, very difficult to do with any positive outfit, outcome, both for yourself and the other person. So something not really to be uh, emphasized. The Buddha likened it to an acro acrobat. So we can liken it simply to two people walking together. If we're walking side by side, you don't say, well, you you watch where you're where I'm walking and I'll watch where you're walking and, and that way we won't trip over anything. It would be absurd to think such a thing. It would be ine inefficient and most likely ineffectual. Whereas if we both focus on our own feet, look, you focus on your feet, I'll focus on my feet, we'll walk together in harmony, neither one of us will trip. And if the world were like this, if we all did our duty, fixed our own problems, clear, clear, cleansed and harmonized, purified our own minds. The world would be in perfect harmony. We wouldn't have to work on our relationships with others. Our interactions with the world around us, people, places, things, animals, whatever, would be pure. It would be free from all of the poisons that we inject into our experiences. So some thoughts on this verse, a simple verse, a simple teaching, but an important one on many levels. So that's the teaching of the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best.